Sup y'all, and welcome to the Food Network, part five. In this video, we're going to take a closer look at the third agricultural revolution and ask this essential question, what effect did the third agricultural revolution have on global food production? The third agricultural revolution, which is often synonymous with the green revolution, began as a result of a series of research, development, and technology transfer initiatives beginning between the 1940s and 1960s. In many respects, it is still in progress and has mainly focused around biotechnology and the development of modern infrastructure such as irrigation canals. So we'll be taking a look at how the world went from this to this. Nice. Consistent with the other agricultural revolutions, the Green Revolution was preceded by colder global temperatures. There was around a 40-year cooling period from the late 1930s to the mid-1970s, likely related to solar activity and cloud formations. Colder temperatures shortened the growing season, leading to lower agricultural productivity and ultimately to greater levels of famine, malnutrition, and starvation. Especially during World War II, a series of famines plagued the planet. For instance, as a result of German occupation in places like Greece, a man-made famine ensued, where the Axis forces purposely withheld the impartation of food and supplies. Now, one of the worst famines in history occurred in the Bengal region of India, where an estimated 3 million people starved to death in 1943. This was caused by unnatural and war-related means, due in part to the difficulty of transporting food to the region. However, it was also caused by natural means through colder global temperatures. Food production declined in the developed world as well, and many farmers began to rely on biotechnology, or technology applied to biological considerations. In this case, food production. More farmers began to rely on chemical farming, utilizing synthetic fertilizers derived mostly from fossil fuels such as petroleum, but they also used synthetic pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. Now enter Norman Borlaug, an American biologist and the father of the Green Revolution. He worked on developing hybrid varieties of wheat in Mexico in the 1940s and adapted these techniques to other crops. By the early 1960s, India was again on the verge of a massive famine. It was then that Borlaug worked with the Indian government and other organizations to introduce new strains of crops and expand irrigation development. These technologies had been used in the developed world for some time, but were now just beginning to emerge in the developing world. While other high-yield varieties, or HYVs, are utilized today for major staple crops such as wheat, rice, and corn, the first one came out of the Philippines in 1966, through a partnership with some American foundations. It was dubbed the Miracle Rice by many people, a product of extensive hybridization. IR-8, standing for International Rice Version 8, required the use of fertilizers and pesticides, but it produced substantially higher yields than previous rice. One study claimed it was 10 times more productive. IR-36 was available by the 1970s, and IR-72 was introduced in the 1990s. This rice today has a resistance against around 15 pests and can produce around 3 harvests a year on the same land. This is referred to as triple cropping. The collective use of HYVs, improved irrigation, and the use of chemical farming, labeled as the Green Revolution, was introduced to other countries and regions with dramatic effect, in places such as Mexico, China, Pakistan, and throughout Southeast Asia. For instance, Mexico became a net exporter of wheat by 1963, and between 1965 and 1970, wheat yields nearly doubled in Pakistan and India, greatly improving the food security in those nations. However, the Green Revolution has had minimal impact in Africa. A lack of money and infrastructure, poorer soils, corruption, a reliance on many different crops, as well as a lack of availability of water for irrigation in many villages has made it difficult for many farmers in the continent to improve their crop yields and, in effect, their lives to the same extent. Now, most food worldwide has become a product of commercialization, motivated by worldwide markets. Mechanization first replaced human labor during the second agricultural revolution on a large scale in the 19th century. Technologies first diffused throughout the farmlands of the United States and Western Europe hierarchically, then diffused contagiously into other developed and developing regions around the world. And due to mechanization and mass production, 
For decades, most food has come from highly industrialized automated operations and businesses known as agribusiness. These companies produce millions of dollars in profit each year, which is a far cry from the family-owned farms of the past. However, most farms in Africa and South, East, and Southeast Asia are still relatively small and often privately owned or run. This helps explain why core countries have such a small percentage of the workforce involved in primary activities, whereas peripheral countries have much larger percentages involved in primary activities. While some argue that the benefits of this green revolution has largely run its course, others contend that improvements are still being made. In fact, some claim that a second green revolution with newer technologies is underway. So what are some conditions that would ensure the future success of the green revolution? For example, if you have excess capital to invest, that certainly helps. Political stability within a country is obviously an advantage. And having independent farmers, not subsistence farmers, and those who can actually invest would also be advantageous for the future success of the Green Revolution. Additionally, countries need good transportation and infrastructure within their own countries. A market economy in which each individual farmer is in for his own benefit also helps. You would also need the cultural acceptance from the society and also education for the new techniques and methods for the new farming. Now, we must also consider conditions that could limit the future success of the Green Revolution. For instance, a decline in soil quality or pollution in the groundwater, which can often happen because of the runoff of chemical fertilizers, or a general increase in cost of fuel or fertilizer, since they are so intertwined. Furthermore, a lack of equality, especially with women who, in many cases, are still unable to receive credit or sometimes ownership of their own land in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and other countries as well. Obviously, crushing debt would be a limit for individuals or for the nation as well, Climatic factors such as erosion or desertification could also be a problem, and many complain that the modern monoculture where you're producing basically one crop on a piece of land has led to a loss of biodiversity, giving us fewer choices. Take a look at this graphic for example. At the top it shows you a variety of crops that were grown back in 1903 in the United States, and you can see for example 497 varieties of lettuce, whereas if you jump forward to 1983 you only see 36 varieties and today it's even less. Since agribusiness is in the business of making money, they find out what crops actually sell well and they promote those. And some have brought up what happens if one of these crops that is so commonly grown actually has a weakness towards a disease or something. Well, then this kind of thing comes around. Back in 2008, the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, which is north of Norway, was opened up. It contains over 400,000 seed varieties and its location was chosen because it's far enough north and at a high enough elevation that if our modern civilization was to end today, those seeds would still be preserved for years to come. Whereas the Green Revolution has largely been based on hybridization and the crossbreeding of cereal crops, the Gene Revolution has harnessed modern biotechnology to create new crops through genetic engineering. Also known as the biotechnology revolution, companies and individuals alter the DNA of foods in laboratories to create genetically modified organisms, or GMOs. While most GMOs are produced by splicing genes from the same plant or species, transgenic organisms are created by splicing genes from different species to insert or shut down specific traits. For instance, potatoes with jellyfish genes that glow when they need to be watered. Most processed foods in the United States are GMOs, including most corn and soybeans, as well as a vast majority of cotton produced in the U.S. Canola oil is almost exclusively derived from GMOs, its name being changed from rapeseed oil back in the 1970s for obvious reasons. While many in the U.S. have embraced GMOs, many regions, including large swaths of Europe, have not. Many question their safety and health, Although, to this day, no study has proven they are less nutritious or more dangerous than traditionally grown foods. Some reasons are also based on economics, since many foreign companies have difficulty competing with giant U.S. food producers. Regardless, for the time being, GMOs are here to stay. In fact, many refer to their invention and proliferation as a fourth agricultural revolution. Well, 